Hello, everybody. Um, thank you all so much for coming out. Uh, my name is Trevor Groth. I am Director of Programming for the Film Festival, and I'm really happy to be able to introduce um, today's panel, uh, the Art of Film panel, one of our power of story strands of programming. And um, I was in s the, the idea for this uh, came to me, actually, when I was asked this past summer to, to participate in a symposium that was looking at the current and future state of film, and by film I mean actual celluloid. And I was really inspired by that conversation and to, for, for two reasons. Um, one, because it, what happened out of it for me was just reframing the conversation. For so long it's been digital versus film. And, and what they were trying to do at that symposium was re re reframe it like d digital and film. Different projects are better suited for one or the other, and it, it would be great to always have the opportunity to have that choice. Um, and the other thing that I took away from it was really inspired by was just hearing the, the artists, cinematographers and directors, actually about their experience um, working with film and why um, it's so special and why they love it. And so that's why we wanted to do this conversation here tonight. We've got um, uh, s some distinguished guests here with us um, to, to talk about it. On the far right, um, coming back to the festival, uh, is Colin Trevaro, who is here with Safety Not Guaranteed. <laughs> and went on to make a little film called Jurassic World. Um, and he's, he's now doing um, one of the new Star Wars as well. Um, uh, to his left is... Um, Someone I first met when he was here with his film, Memento, uh, went on to uh, make some truly uh, incredible studio films that prove you can have artistry and independence in a studio film. Of course, that's Christopher Nolan. And to his left um, is a cinematographer who's had many films here at the festival, including Dope, Fruitvale Station, and Little Accidents, um, Rachel Morrison. <laughs> and so moderating the conversation today is a, a director and star actor of uh, film Joshi here at the festival. Um, Alex Ross Perry, uh, who I first met, uh, showed uh, Impolex, a film he did at Cinevegas that I used to program. Um, he went on to... On 35 millimeter. On 35 millimeter. Um, uh, and he was here also with Listen Up, Philip, and he recently had uh, Queen of Earth, which premiered at the Berlin Film Festival. So um, that's it. I will let them start talking about film. Uh, all right. Make sure the mic's working. Thanks, Trevor, and thanks to everybody who asked us to come do this. Uh, I'm not a moderator by profession, so there might be a little, a little adjustment here. But um, you know, I think for the sake of this panel and the power of story and art of the story, you know, we're not we're not going to talk about wh why we like film. For the sake of this, just assume that everyone up here truly believes in it, and don't think about whether or not it's better than video or whatever. That's not what we're here for. We're all here because we feel the same way about it or feel like it's just not, that, it's not either or, it's just, or it's not better than, it's, you know, these are both different tools, so. I can't promise not to talk right. about violence, <laughs> I'm just saying. I'm, if you I'll at try. some point slip into a tirade against the Alexa, I, I'll, I won't cut you off. Okay. I'll let that go on as long as I feel like listening to it, which will be a while. <laughs> but if people were waiting for me to say, so why do you shoot on film? I will not ask that, because we're going to assume that everybody would say, because I like it, and because it's better, or because it's appropriate for the film. So talking about story, I mean, let's just start by talking about you know, the use of it as the canvas of a piece, and the effect it has on storytelling. Because for me, and I've said this about my own low-budget films, it's the biggest and only special effect that I have on movies that don't cost very much money. And it's part of the, it's part of the aesthetic. It's not a technical choice. It's not a budgetary choice. It's the same as the costumes people are wearing. For me, it's part of what the movie is, and that's to me an interesting thing that we can all talk about: is why you feel drawn to it, and 
Colin has recently shot uh, a small movie on film, and, and Rachel has worked on movies, you know, on film for budgets similar to what I've done. And uh, you know, you're fanatical about not wanting to give give video a, a kind word here, and <laughs> have never shot on it, uh, which I have not either. So yeah, let's just talk. Let's just start by talking about the value of it as part of creating the movie that you want people to see. Uh, Colin. Yeah, I mean, we, uh, so this, you know, the small film, yeah, it's certainly a lot larger than my, my first film, which was, <coughs> was very small. It was a $10 million movie uh, that we just shot this fall called The Book of Henry. Uh, and, you know, and the choice, uh, the choice for us uh, came down to wanting uh, the audience to, to feel a certain thing. And, and the feeling of this movie is, is very timeless. Uh, and it tells what feels like a very old story. And, uh, and I, I do tend to, the, the only, you know, if, if we're gonna have any kind of conversation about film versus digital, the only place where I, I tend to, uh, to not be able to attach myself entirely uh, to something uh, you know, shot digitally is, is when that's a period. Uh, film. Uh, there's there's something in my brain that immediately says, well, they, they didn't have video cameras then, and they, they couldn't do that. And uh, and this film is not a period film, but it, it does feel like it takes place in a, in a time that that you can't quite put your finger on. Um, and uh, we found it even as we're cutting it right now, there is a sense to uh, the the importance of every shot. And there's there's things that maybe if they were digital that that we might allow that because they're on film we have to to honor it and, and make it make it film worthy. Uh, and so that's that's where it comes uh, for me is 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 not so much how film looks, but how film feels and how it it tends to remind us of of our memories, uh, of our childhoods, mm -hmm. uh, the way we used to see films. And so it was important for me, uh, certainly for this one. And you uh, shot Jurassic like World on film, which you we shot Jurassic 35 and 65. Uh, we shot the Book of Henry is actually three perf, two to one. Uh, and Jurassic World was two to one also, uh, and for two different reasons. Should we explain what that means? Yeah, so, uh, so two to one is you know, an aspect ratio in between 185 and, and scope, and, and uh, in Jurassic, we made, it was something that Vittorio Storaro first uh, introduced as, as a medium uh, between, between flat and scope, and we felt with Jurassic that it allowed for us to, to uh, have humans and dinosaurs in the frame. All the other Jurassic movies had been 185. Uh, and, and, and yet I wanted a scope to the film, and so we found a, a balance right in between. And then when we went to do The Book of Henry, uh, you know, the three perf choice was a little bit of a, of a political, you know, I, I want to shoot on film, and here's a way that you can, you know, save 25% on, on costs of, of, of stock and processing uh, to make it go down a little easier uh, when we were, we were pitching out, a, you know, how to do this film. Uh, and the two to one, uh, it's something that John and I felt very comfortable with, and we like, uh, it, it allows us to, you know, it's, it's a human drama, but that turns into a suspense thriller. And so for the first half of the movie, it, it's nice to be able to have, you know, th those, that sense of a 185 intimate human drama, and then as we get into the suspense thriller side, to be able to play with the scope uh, a little bit more. So, uh, but these, you know, in the end, these are all artistic choices, they're creative choices, and, and I, I feel like what is most important to me about film is that people have the choice to use it. It's, it's not that I would say you have, you know, one should do this or one should do the other. You, 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 don't, you don't go to the symphony to hear the Stradivarius, you go to hear the violinist, and if the violinist is gonna choose, is gonna choose the best possible violin, of course they will. I choose to shoot with the best possible violin. Great, I'm glad you made, I was gonna make you reuse that comparison that you told me the other day. So I think it's apt. I've always, you know, yeah, it's just, it's about, op was this a fight for you when you said we were trying to convince them to, to let us shoot this way? Who were you? You know, I, who, who, I, I try not dare to. dare tell you not, not to shoot on <laughs> Look, people say, we'll say no all the time to a lot of things. This happened to be a, a great experience and a very collaborative one. It wasn't necessarily a fight, it was, us trying to make a movie that wouldn't necessarily, you know, be able to be made at this budget. It's still, you know, $10 million uh, uh, for a movie that is, you know, essentially a, a human drama with, you know, Naomi Watts and several children uh, that also, you know, involves murder uh, is, is not the easiest sell. And, and as, as a filmmaker, I want to continue to, to challenge myself and to take risks. And, and one, one of the benefits when you make a, a giant corporation more than a billion dollars is you can say, hey, like, this is something that I care about. You know, I'm going to take all of the chips that I have and slide them back on the table and, and take another risk. And you know, in the end, I, I am an independent filmmaker. That's just that's who and what I am. And, and uh, part of, of me coming to terms with 
making larger films and, and trying to infuse that sensibility into those larger films is to be able to go back and, and continue to challenge myself and make, honestly, make the films that I feel I should have made between Safety Not Guaranteed mm -hmm. uh, and Jurassic World. I think there were a couple movies in the middle uh, that, that were skipped over, but I feel like now I've earned the ability to go back and, and fill in the, right. the like gap. You, you skipped Star Wars 9 to make Jurassic <laughs> World, now you're gonna no, exactly. circle back around. I it. didn't get to skip that one, no. but you know. Uh, <laughs> And that one, you know, and, and so I, I feel, you know, that Star Wars gets back to, a, a, you know, I, my issue about shooting digital for period films. Like, I could never shoot S Star Wars on anything but, but scope 35 and 65 because it's a period film. It happened a long time ago. There you go. <laughs> uh, Chris, any, you know, you, you spoke very eloquently to me the other day about, you know, the purpose of, of the medium and the value it has on the stories you're telling in a grand scale, more so than anything I've ever dreamt. Well, one of the, one of the uh, things that came out of the symposium that Trevor was referring to in his introduction, it was a symposium we did at the Getty Center with Tacita Dean, who's an artist who works on 16 millimeter film. And she was able to bring to bear a number of really compelling arguments from the art world that are unanswerable and incredibly important to do with what they call medium specificity, which is to say, if, if you're working on film, then it needs to be shown on film the same way that a gallery can't put up a, uh, a print of a Picasso and say that they're showing you the Picasso. So if something is digitized and then shown digitally, it has to be considered a translation of the work. And so as far as exhibition goes, it's something that's you know, very important in the art world. It's very important uh, for film history and, and in the film world as well. But what, what it started to uh, bring out is the idea of film not as a technology, um, because technologies are superseded. Technologies are you know, something else comes along and then they're dropped. It's not a technology, it's a medium. And as a medium, it has things like medium specificity. If you make a film on film and you want it shown on film, that needs to be supported and respected. Um, but also the concept of medium resistance. Medium resistance in the art world is if you like to sculpt with clay as opposed to carving marble, there are reasons for that to do with how that medium feeds back your creative process. And as I heard Tassida talk about this so eloquently, it, it suddenly occurred to me that that's absolutely true of, of film. Um, and one of the reasons, you know, you talk about from a storytelling point of view, we're sort of back to a situation which, when I was in college, I was running the, the film society, and we shared, uh, we shared a basement with the video society. So there's film, there's video, and we all did our thing, and we all worked in these very different ways. And one of the things that the video guys would do, that the film guys would do differently, is they would just run a lot of takes, a lot of, you know, they'd wind up with 10 takes of something where it, something was kind of wrong with every take. And the film guys, because we put all our money in 16 mil film and we could hear the money running through the projector, <laughs> yeah. there'd be this magical moment where everything had to work perfectly. And that expectation and that energy is the medium speaking back to you. It's literally hearing the film run through the camera and everybody on set knowing, oh shit, this is it. This is the moment we have to, to do the thing. And that gives you a creative energy that affects the storytelling process. And it's very different to when you shoot on video. And there are guys, you know, there are, there are filmmakers, video makers working on video who embrace the looseness, the fluidity of it, you know, wonderfully. But it has to be recognized that it's different and mm -hmm. it's a different process. And so for me, that focus on the storytelling of that particular shot in that particular moment is very, very much informed by the fact that it's being laid down as light onto celluloid photochemically and that, 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 that speaks to the storytelling in every aspect. Yeah, I mean, I've always felt that that's, a, I mean, I still don't understand how that works. That is a process to me that I would define as magic. Yeah. Whereas I understand how you press a button on a video camera and it records onto a chip. That makes perfect sense to me. Mm -hmm. And I've never even thought about how, I've never thought about why. But there's just something so ephemeral about light and lenses that is so a part of the medium. And you're talking about uh, Tacita Dean and upstairs I mentioned, you know, another filmmaker Ben Rivers who's British based who works in 16 and develops in his bathtub mm -hmm. and we were saying you know uh, when we spoke you know, for me I've noticed there's a lot of artists you, you say the word artists working in short form on film and 
here there's, I, I was asking upstairs if there were films in competition or in Next that were shot on film, and I believe I was told no, or if there was one, they couldn't think of it. And you go to a Rotterdam film festival, um, where I believe following played. Yeah. And there's probably a dozen, two dozen, 30 short form pieces being projected on eight millimeter or 16 millimeter. And that, you know, we'll talk about this in a little bit, but hopefully, there's not going to be the perception of this endless divide where people think this is just for art and that if you want to make entertainment, then you don't do that. If you want to work on 16, you go make a five minute loop and you play it in a gallery. And if you want to make a-, a Well, a and, and part of the reason for that, and one of the reasons I'm here today and, and thrilled to hear that Colin just shot a relatively small film on film and looking at your work and how efficiently that was made on film for an incredible price. The, the most important message that, that needs to get out there right now is this artificial industrial distinction that's been made that shooting on video is of the future and is practical and is the way forward. Shooting on film is impractical and is the past. And it's simply not the case. It needs to be a choice ongoing into the future. And I don't, we've, we've made a strong effort to reframe the discussion uh, over the last couple of years in terms of there's no point in sitting debating resolutions, you know, all the rest, color reproduction. You know, there's no point in endlessly comparing the two media. You just have to say they're different. And it's very, very important that young and new filmmakers, new talent at places like Sundance or Rotterdam, people coming into the business, understand that they should shoot the film the way they want to shoot it. And film is absolutely available and it's completely practical for them to do so. And the relentless amount of disinformation that's been around, particularly in the last 10 years, talking about why there must be this inevitable shift towards video. Um, it does have to be counted to a degree, so there is a certain amount still of that. Mm -hmm. You know, you have, to, you have to stand up for the truth and for what you know to be true in the medium you work in. And I'm in a very, very privileged position of, over the last 10 years, getting to work with film and the digital translation of film and video cameras, we've been comparing them every week, pretty much every day for months at a time. And so I have a, a very specific insight into it. And I hear a lot of things that simply aren't true and need to be counted. And the main one being, you know, when you casually refer to, you know, Ben Rivers processing film in his bathtub, it's extremely important because, you know, the first thing is, well, there are no labs left. And there are labs all over the place. There's two labs in England. There's a great lab, Photochem in Los Angeles, you know. Um, and by the way, you can process film in your bathtub if you really want to. Elias Merg used yeah. to do that. It's completely doable. This if it's isn't... important to the work, and if that's yeah. part of your, your tools, then it's just, it makes perfect sense. Absolutely. Um, and so the point is, as a medium, it will continue to exist and has to continue to exist. And um, it's pointless to pretend that it isn't and that it has to go away so that a generation of new filmmakers coming in don't get to experiment with it, if that's what they want to do. <laughs> So really, uh, it's important to make the argument for choice uh, and communicate the possibilities that are out there for filmmakers now. Yeah. Rachel, do you have these problems with people telling the films you've shot, they can't be sh shot on film? Or you mentioned Fruitville was Super 16, Little Accidents, 35. Is this a fight uh, at these small levels, as I've sort of had in my own small way? I mean, it, yeah, it, it is with the producers. I think you definitely, for in my case, I need to have <clears throat> I mean, the director on board. You know, whether I recommend it or, or they recommend it to begin with, it's something where we both have to really believe in it. Um, as a DP, you know, it's not enough for me to say we should shoot on film. We really need the director going to bat for it as well. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I think there's so many advantages. And, and it really is story dependent. I think what these guys have been speaking to about it being a choice is so relevant, you know, for a number of reasons. Like for me, I, I equate film with humanity, and you know, for the most part, I tell these dramatic, very humane stories. And there's this tactile, sort of subtextual, subconscious quality that, you know, comes inherently from film. Can you achieve some extent of that digitally and post? Maybe, but often that requires so much money that the same people who couldn't afford to spend it on film in the first place aren't going to, you know, dedicate enough money to then spend time to do it right in post. Um, but the biggest thing for me when it comes to choices is there's so many things you can do with film that you can't, you know, that you can't do with digitally. It's not just about grain, it's about you can push process, you can pull process, you can bleach bypass, you can flash a negative, you can throw the shutter out of whack and like there, it, 
it gives so many more options to me as a storyteller and therefore the directors, I mean, the stories to be told that, you know, I think it's incredibly valuable to not just think of it as film or, you know, grain, but it's really within film, there's, you know, it opens up a world of possibility. Um, and then, you know, one other thing I would say, speaking of what Chris mentioned, the idea of it, okay, costing a certain amount of money, money through, running through the gate, it does really up the stakes and it also allows oftentimes for a much more single camera medium, which as a DP, you know, it allows you to put the camera in the right place. There's this sort of tendency I'm finding, you know, in the last few years as, as cameras become less expensive to throw more cameras at the problem. We're right. going to shoot, you know, instead of doing a project in 30 days with one camera, we're going to do it in 20 days with two. And effect effectively, you, you know, you end up doing these sort of slightly compromised, hopefully you're doing this and not this. But if you are doing this, you're still, you know, you're slight, slightly compromising the eyeline on one of those shots. And so there's something really nice that film also lends itself to a single camera medium as much as possible. Um, and that, you know, for me is, is really invaluable because when you tell a story that's about humanity, you want people to, you want to have control of your eyeline. I mean, that's, you know, incredibly important, so. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned, you know, uh, you're talking about the options you have with film, and I know we've all spoken about this, and you're talking about us kind of coming out now of a pretty dark 10-ish years, five years of disinformation and the options getting smaller. And I'm curious if everybody thinks, as I know you've been saying, that perhaps we are moving past that and now it's time to turn the narrative around in the press where people say one thing and perhaps we're returning to a time where we're going to be seeing more film stocks introduced and we were just, uh, you know, recently Kodak announced plans for Super 8 camera to be brought back into the marketplace. And um, I know you were about to speak with someone about that when we talked last week. And Yeah, no, I, I uh, took a look at the prototype. It looks terrific. It's a new Super 8 camera that, that Kodak is introducing at CES. So it's incredibly exciting because it's exactly that. I started off shooting Super 8 films. That was my entry into filmmaking. And having the physical film, being able to put it on a projector, throw it up you know, on a wall in your living room or whatever, there's something to that medium that's very, very unique that there isn't uh, a video equivalent for. Now, there are plenty of very cool things that you know, video technology enables young people coming to the movies to do that I wasn't able to do. But I would hate for you know, kids today and new filmmakers coming in to not be able to do the things I was able to do and experience the relationship with the intervening medium of, of film that I was. Because, I mean, I know, you know we said we don't want to talk too much about uh, comparisons, but it's a little difficult not to in certain areas, because if you're asking me to say what it is about film uh, that moves me or that guides me, I think that th for me, it's always had a very tactile sense of the intervening medium. It's always felt like, you know, when I watch Fruitvale Station, it's carved in oak, as opposed to being, you know, stenciled on plywood. That's the difference to me. It's like. Video has a fluidity to it that I don't, I don't know where the authoritative version of it's going to be. I don't know where it's going to land. I don't know where the thing's going to exist. I feel that as I watch uh, films. I feel that it's authoritative, that it's been inscribed, that it's, that it's finished and it's done, and that the filmmakers put all their eggs into that, that basket. And that's a powerful emotional feeling of the way in which I, I watch other people's films and the way in which I, I try to make my own. Um, and I think, for me, that started with, with Super 8. You know, we used to, you know, you'd shoot your, your three-minute rolls, and then you'd send it to the photo mat, and you'd wait two weeks for it to, to come back. Mm -hmm. And the excitement after two weeks of, like, well, what did we do? Uh, you know, that, that was really, really thrilling. Yeah, well, and now for me, you know, and I'm sure you've experienced this on smaller movies, and the excitement on set when two days later, on a low-budget movie where you're only dropping things off once in a while, when you finally get day yeah. one's footage back and it's the lunchtime on day three. Yeah. I mean, everybody drops what they're doing and there's just this celebration of everyone huddling around the computer and looking at these downloadable dailies and just you ho you've been holding your breath. And that to me is so exciting, much well, that, more so than this fear that the zeros and ones of your, of your images might just disappear if someone spills a cup of coffee on a, <laughs> on a hard drive. Well, and the thrill, you know, uh, being able to print the film and screen data, which is what I do, I mean, that's, it's just a, it's a remarkable thing to sit there with all your collaborators, all your creative collaborators, and, and see the, the film up there, um, the way it's going to project for the audience. It's a, it's a very valuable part of the process. Uh, and it really, it really all comes down to this idea of focus and what the medium, the medium gives me 
and my collaborators extreme focus in, in all areas of you know what's what's going in front of that camera it's very interesting what you said about the single camera approach because I hadn't really thought of it in those terms but I, I always shot everything I do single camera except for stunts or unrepeatable things where you you need to do all your angles at the same time but um, that yeah having one camera in the right place as opposed to two cameras in slightly the wrong place uh, it's it's a really important part of focus and when you work in uh, when you work in studio films, there's all kinds of pressure on new directors to shoot in a particular way. They tell you to use Steadicam because it's quicker than laying track. You know, things, all these kind of quite arbitrary things. And what's happened over the last 10 years is one of those things has become you can't shoot on film. Um, and what you need as a filmmaker is you need a, a team around you. You need line producers and UPMs who understand that it's an important creative choice and they can balance the figures and make the budget work fine. It isn't any more expensive to shoot on film. It's a, one of those things that's been put out there that just isn't true. Budgets of studio movies aren't coming down, they're going up, you know, it's not. The, the bigger picture is it's up to the filmmakers, the directors, the producers in collaboration to figure out where that money gets spent and what it is they want to do. And a great UPM or great line producer can really help you do that, and, uh, give you that choice. Yeah, and part of what Rachel said when we spoke before was, you know, part of this in convincing people of that will have to be moving towards a place where the film stocks are truly doing things that digital is not, um, which obviously we already believe they do, but not everybody does. Everybody says you can just fake it and you can replicate these images. And you spoke about, you know, this exciting hope that we have that something like reversal stock could come back and no one could say you can fake reversal on a digital camera because you can't, I mean, nothing looks like film shot on reversal anymore. And if that came back, then that wouldn't be a money decision. That would be a true conversa conversation about the way the movie's going to look, not about which you know, equipment you're using. Well, and my secret hope, and since I have a forum to say, say as much, Kodak, if you're out there, is to bring back some of the older stocks. You know, I think what, what's happened is now there's only, because of the supply and demand is, you know, is what it is, there's only a select number of stocks to choose from. And they tend to be the stocks that were developed sort of looking towards more resolution and more latitude. But in some ways, it's the older stocks that had more visible grain, less latitude, that really have a very distinct look. So, I mean, I don't know if this is possible, but the idea of being able to batch select a stock, you know, you guys, if it, it, maybe not in my world, but if you guys wanted to create a stock for a film and to go back to the pre-vision days or vision one days and really choose some things that, that don't look anything like digital, um, you know, that would be my perfect world. Could you guys do that? <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, I mean, I've, I've been talking to Kodak about modifications to stocks relating to specific pro products. It's all a conversation that's perfectly possible to have. Uh -huh. Um, at the end of the day, the T-grain stocks, the vision stocks, you know, they're, they're built to mimic the way the eye sees <clears throat> incredibly well and specifically. It's certainly true that video technology has, that's been what it's been chasing the whole time. So, yes, at a superficial reading, they may seem more similar, but um, it's a little hard to argue that the toss when you talk to the, uh, the chemists and engineers at Kodak, when they talk about the way in which the response curves will change and whatever if you're looking for. I, I'm, I'm always looking for naturalism, and so that's very much the way these stocks have been developed. So they're kind of the best they've ever been, which is worth pointing out because even though I have a certain amount of nostalgia for some of the older stocks, and particularly reversal, but I think I would have to say hand on heart, the stocks they make now, I mean, they're the best they've ever been in, in 100 years of cinema, they're incredible. Um, and they're as fast as you need, you know, they've got a 500 ASA. They dropped the 800 ASA they had 10 years ago because people found it too grainy because at the time, you know, and we've talked to them about potentially reintroducing that. It's, it's all possible as a discussion. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, they make a, you know, a fantastic 500 ASA stock. You could push a stop if you want to have a 1,000 ASA and, you know, shoot with wide open lenses. I mean, it's an incredibly, it's an incredibly versatile medium for mocking the way that the eye sees nature. Mm -hmm. I, I just something I was I, that frustrates me a little bit is how it, very recently f film has has sort of been pushed into the to the realm of the elite uh, where no one has access to it uh, and and that's you know I I learned on film at NYU I was at NYU in '99 and we were talking I guess you were a little bit later and they they still in the in the first class in sight and sound they still do film even today? Well, I don't know about today. No, today, I think the at first NYU. class at NYU, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and so you know, we were on we were Steam, cutting, we were cutting on film, and, and and I think that not only does that, you know, it gives you a respect for the shot, it gives you a respect for the edit, 
Uh, but you know, when you talk about the Super 8 camera, I was looking at that and I got all excited. I'm like, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get one of these for my kids and, and we're gonna go and I'm gonna teach them how to, and I looked at the cost of, of each one of those reels of film and it's like, okay, well, you know, there's a democratization that, that, that digital brought to filmmaking where anyone anywhere can get their hands now, you know, on an iPhone, on a video camera and make a film. And there is something, uh, that's, I think that's part of the, the struggle with film right now is that because of the costs that are, that are you know, that are incurred by, you know, trying to, to shoot, even, even just for someone, you know, a kid at their home who wants to learn, uh, it makes it that much more difficult for everybody to have the opportunity to do it. And, and to me, it actually puts a little bit of the responsibility on film schools uh, because they've got a lot of money. And people, you know, we pay a lot of money to go to these schools. They do, and, they, you know, and they've all dropped the ball on this. They, uh, there, yeah, there are I very think few. The, the National Film and Television School in London, graduate films are still done on film. Yeah. Um, there are various, I think, New York Film Academy. Yeah. A, lot of the, a lot of the big guys, um, they have to be shamed back into it because, yeah, the idea that you charge people what you charge in tuition, and I didn't go to film school, so it's easy for me to rail about that. <laughs> it, it's like the idea that you charge that to get some camera that you could buy for half of one semester's tuition. You know, I mean, it's... Well, you're not really teaching that this is one of the choices. No, you're not. You're not teaching it's one of the choices. You're also not teaching the discipline, the underlying discipline that the entire film industry is based on because we still mix in reels, we still count feet and frames, we still, even if you're shooting digitally, you know, you have to understand, to understand how an Avid works, to understand how all the latest digital technology that applies to film works, you're much better off as part of your education if you understand how film works, because that's where it's all come from. Um, and so the film schools really do have to, to gear up with that. I mean, to speak to your point about the democratization of you know, video technology, that's absolutely true. Um, it is worth pointing out, though, that what the studios have done in the last few years is applied the consumer economics of that to large-scale production, which is facile. It's complete nonsense. They're just, um, that's where the disinformation comes mm -hmm. in. You know, the idea that, as you say, it's more expensive to shoot Super 8 than it is to use your, your phone, you know, to record something, absolutely true. But if you think you're gonna make your, you know, $100 million film cheaper because you shoot it on digital, I mean, it's absurd. It's completely untrue. No. And that's, that's the thing that, that has to be kind of put out there because my, my hope, you know, when I look at, you think of young people coming up, you know, is, is these kids who are making videos using whatever's to hand, which is what we did when we were kids, but I'm old enough that what was to hand was my dad's Super 8 camera, mm -hmm. you know, that if, you, if these kids then get the chance to play the Stradivarius, you know, if they have the cheap violin and they learn how to be a really good violinist and somebody doesn't say, Miss, is the, is the thing, is when I came to do uh, my first sort of budgeted film where we were spending millions of dollars, you know, it's because <laughs> those don't exist anymore or whatever. I mean, that which was memento, and we spent, I think we had about $3 million to make the film. Uh, one of the first things I found out was we weren't gonna print dailies, because at the time, the, the wisdom was, you take a negative, you tell us, and you look at your dailies on video. And I'd come from making a, a, a six thousand dollar film before that, where we looked at our dailies on film, you know, whatever. And I was appalled, and, and had the conversation with the line producer, and she rearranged the numbers. And, and these struggles have been around forever. I mean, the interesting thing that, that I think is misunderstood about the way this has developed is it suppresses all some things that you should work out so that we could do select takes, not everything but we would see some of what we were doing every day on, on film. It's surprising for people to realize that the first time I had to justify shooting film, um, like the first time this conversation happened, where it's like, okay, why do you want to do it on film? Why don't you just do it on video? Um, was on my first film in the 90s. You know, I mean, this is how long this conversation has been going on. And it was, you know, as hard to justify then in, in other than in emotional terms as it is now. You just say, but. This is what I this is what I want to do, so that the the fight's been around you know forever in those terms. It's so it's always that tension between what you feel you want to do as a as a creative individual and what you're bringing to it as as a director, and then finding the team around you who can who can support that and uh, understand the importance of those choices. A lot of it does might have to do with with 
how you were brought up and what was around you. Because I, my mother was a photographer, and she developed film in our laundry room, and and I got to feel it and touch it and see see film go in the bath and understand that. And I'm actually I'm kind of actually the opposite of you in that I don't understand how the images go on the computer chip. I don't know how that works. Uh, that makes no sense to me. Whereas whereas light hitting film and and then putting more light through it and having an image projected on a screen, I completely get that in my brain. Yeah. Well, it's not that I don't get it. It's just that I choose to, <laughs> I choose I to not care about it. That no way. idea how the computer works. But yeah, I mean, there, you know, there was like a quote about this when uh, I don't know if you saw the Leos Carax film Holy Motors three or four years ago. It's his first film shot digitally, and someone said, "What camera did you shoot it on?" He said, "I didn't shoot it on a camera. We shot on a computer." <laughs> and he said, "When his Escoffier, his DP, died, he said, I don't know anyone else who can shoot film the way he does, so I don't know how to do it anymore.' But yeah, that's to me that kind of feels like it. It's just a computer thing." But not to get sidetracked, um, talking about Holy Motors, but you well, talk that exists everywhere, though. I mean, that idea. I mean, we used to talk, you know, even in Jurassic World, like this can't look like two computers fighting. Mm -hmm. Like <laughs> that's that was always our, it was our. We kept repeating to ourselves, yeah. and and you know that that debate, you know, goes into the use of animatronics, the use of practical effects. Like I feel like there is a there's a link between all of these things, this you know, film versus digital, practical versus you know, creating these images in a the computer. There has been a movement back toward uh, a lot of these analog practices. And, and my, own, my biggest frustration is that it tends to fall into the realm of, of the guys on Mount Olympus, of, uh, you know, who can, who can make, you know, JJ can make these choices uh, because of where he's at. Uh, and and what, where does that leave? everybody else who really want to be making the same kinds of choices uh, but aren't able to because of this idea that digital costs less. Well, this is a relevant point and also something that I think we can all speak to and I believe, I think, part of why I was asked to do this. Um, because, you know, there, there, is, there has to be something that exists in between Star Wars, Interstellar, and the movies that I've made and that you've made that play at festivals like this. And, you know, there is this vast divide and you speak a lot about misinformation. And I think in the eyes of most people, if there is misinformation and if people are told that this is cheaper and harder, then the only thing they hear is Hateful Eight's on film, your movies are released on film if you, you know, want them to be, and they're shot on film. And then they don't know that there's this world beneath them of movies being made for a million dollars less, a little bit more. Um, you know, I made two films before Listen Up, Philip, which played here in the realm of the budget of following. Um, Fifteen and twenty thousand dollars, both on film, and we made sacrifices to do that. But there does seem to be this big gap, and this fits into the misinformation thing you talk about, where anybody says you can't afford it. I made two movies under a million dollars on Super 16 in the last two years. Yeah, it's not just for you and you and and no. JJ Abrams. And uh, part of what you said you were interested in coming here is just to make sure that if we're combating misinformation, it's just about being really vocal about it. And it's become something that I end up talking about in every interview because it's a huge fun thing to talk about for people. And it's a selling point of my movies and it's a selling point of any independent movie that you've worked on because it'll be one of 10 at a festival that's shot that way or you know, the only one. And just, you know, I'm interested in how you feel that there, how to fill in the gap between people saying, well, of course you can shoot on film, but how can I? Because I can answer that, but I feel like most people still don't know that. No, well, I mean, I think this, this panel is part of the answer. I think hearing you speak about it is a very important part of the answer, and I think it speaks to, to your desire as well. I mean, the, the fact that you're here talking about it in these terms, it tells people something, and the fact that you're able to point to a film you, you just made for under $200,000, it's 16 mil, uh, I mean, you look at Carol this year, Todd Haynes' marvelous film. And it's one of the most stunning looking films I've, I've ever seen. Uh, Super 16, Ed Larkman, I mean, incredible work. So just letting people know that, you know, I, I felt a few years ago, I felt like when most of the projectors in the world sort of became, you know, digital projectors, that at that point, this sort of corporate uh, unintentional conspiracy around it, the sort of push to kill film, because there has been a very strong push a over the last years. <laughs> Unintentional right. conspiracy. When yeah. you say conspiracy, it sounds like everybody sits in a room and, you know, whatever. And it's, it's like, no, of course not. But there's been a, well, I'll give you the, the example uh, that I would point to is Quentin, you know, worked his ass off to shoot a fantastic movie on 65 mil and do a 70 mil rollout of it. And it worked tremendously well, and the film looks incredible. You know, for those of you who haven't seen it, on 70, I mean, it's really wonderful to look at. He had one press screening where there was a problem with one of the lenses, mm -hmm. and so they switched to the DCP after the interval, 
Uh, and the, the, I spoke to a couple of people in the screening who said, yeah, the DCP didn't even look as good as the slightly wrong projection, you know, the 70 mil print beforehand. Press sort of held this up as some kind of, oh, you see, you don't know what you're talking about. You see, you shouldn't have done this on film. I mean, it's, it's, it's ludicrous. As opposed to, this is a filmmaker who's struggled very hard, worked very hard to really push something out there in the world to entertain people, to give them the best possible experience and should be celebrated for that. But as soon as there's some little technical hitch, it's as if it's his fault. Like, he built the projector. Like, he, I, I, had the same, I had the same experience myself on uh, one of the IMAX films I'd made where there had been a press screening and the digital sound had gone out of sync with the picture and then people asked me about it. I'm like, I'm the, I'm the director, I'm not the projectionist. Like, these things happen. But there's a culture around wanting to kill film whereby any little hiccup like that that happens all the time in, in the digital world is pointed to as some kind of proof of something. Or, you know, I hear it now from uh, people who've gone, you know, who liked film but went digital, they'll talk about, oh, there are more stock defects, there are this, there are that, none of which is true. I mean, I, I've been shooting film my entire career. In the last couple of years, I've shot Super 8, 16 mil, three perf 35, four perf 35, four perf 35 anamorphic, five perf 65 millimeter, 15 perf 65 millimeter, all in the last couple of years, zero stock defects, no problems whatsoever. Best lab work we've ever had, you know. That's the reality of, of where the film world is, is like you can get incredible work done. Mm -hmm. Are there problems in it? Of course there are problems in it. But and people are excited to say, this problem would never happen with the DCP. Yeah, I mean, I, very, I did. Very eager to say that. As I mean, I'll, I'll give you the example. I did two DGA screenings this year for other filmmakers. One was on film, one was digital. The film screening went perfectly. The digital one, the projector broke down, 10 minutes of black, really hurt the momentum of the film. It was very unfortunate. It just happens, you know? But I never heard that spoken about. I never, you know, because it's not of interest to people. Mm -hmm. There's, that's what I mean about an unintentional conspiracy. I'm just talking about a culture that's grown up around, we've got to kill the way things are, we've got to kill the status quo in order to usher in the new thing, which is no longer necessary. You know, there's a, there's a degree of, aggression that you understand a company's a wide rollout of needing to uh, you know put out new projectors or, or whatever but at the point at which that's happened that need ceases and we can all be grown up and responsible and try and give filmmakers the choice that they should have mm -hmm. and that's that's where the conversation uh, needs to go now and it needs to go there for new filmmakers for lower budget filmmakers and it's it's very important. Yeah, I mean, just speaking briefly about, you know, you're talking about presentation and, you know, the symphony comparison. When I go see a film projected on 35, I have great respect for the projectionist, and I feel like I'm watching a live performance yeah. where anything could happen. And when I'm watching uh, something that someone probably pressed the button on and walked away, I don't feel that way. There's a kind of excitement and a spontaneity, and the thing is alive, and it's never looked exactly the way it looks right now, and it'll never look that way again, and everything yeah. will be slightly different, and that's exciting. No, it's, it's a performance. It's, it's something we talk to the exhibitors about a lot, about wanting to do 70 mil presentation or IMAX film presentation or whatever. It's about showmanship. It's about putting on a show for the audience, and the exhibitors have to be our partners with that. Mm -hmm. And film is a fantastic way to do that. It has no defining resolution. You can't compare it with your 2K TV or your 4K TV. It's a very unique and, and uh, distinctive thing. Um, and that has to be embraced and celebrated, not this somehow this sort of consumer desire that's crept in that everything should be the same everywhere. The film should be identically presented everywhere, even if that means it's presented worse. It's what I call the kind of McDonald's approach. It's like, yeah, it's all a bit worse, but it's exactly the same everywhere you see it. It's like, yeah, but... Carl, we have a little fine dining at the top of that pyramid somewhere. You were comparing filmmaking to McDonald's upstairs earlier as well. <laughs> I, mean, I do sometimes. I would say, well, that's, that's not a, a different subject, but I, I was saying how you can, you know, with something like Jurassic, you can make something that is, uh, is completely insane at first blush until it becomes McDonald's, and then it just feels normal. And, and, and that's one of the great things about, you know, making big movies is that you can do things that, uh, you know, that when you, you, know, you, you watch a trailer of a, of a guy on a motorcycle with a bunch of raptors, you're like, well, that's crazy. And then, uh, and then it, you know, the, the audience accepts it, and suddenly it's like, well, that's just what happened. Of course, what else would you do? What, would, what else would one do? Uh, and, and, and yet, you know, the thing that, I don't know, I, I think the thing that is good, just to, to talk about a positive 
uh, developments uh, that Kodak is doing, and they've been very proactive as far as making it possible for younger filmmakers and new filmmakers who don't have uh, you know, the money, uh, is uh, by, you know, we, we actually developed uh, in a mobile lab, uh, the Book of Henry was the first movie to use uh, the Alpha Lab, which Kodak uh, created a full processing lab in a giant trailer that's able to drive anywhere in the country, and they drove it to New York, and we processed uh, out of this lab, which was parked in Queens, and now I think it's somewhere else. Uh, and uh, you know the ability. I mean, as as you know, as the labs go away, and it, it makes it you know everything gets that much. That sense of inaccessibility grows, uh, and I think that's the biggest issue. Like I, I don't like I don't like couching things as a fight. Like I think it's I think there is a collaboration. I think any any studio who decides to make a movie, you're going to put millions of dollars into a movie. You believe in that movie, and there there's there's a want for that movie to be good. And I think if if we can go to the financiers of our films, uh, and very earnestly and proactively say, look here here are some things that we can do to make this work for you. I'm going to shoot on three perf. That's 25% off processing and 25% less talk, stock right away. Uh, you know, yeah, you don't want to ship everything back to LA to, ha to have it developed. We ha we've, you know, Kodak has provided us mm -hmm. with this with this mobile lab, and and I think as as Kodak continues to work toward it, and I think as as other filmmakers try to be as proactive as possible uh, to to find ways to make it possible at the sub not just sub hundred million dollar level, our movie's $10 million. And, and how much, I mean, God, how much was I mean, Proofville Station? Proofville was under 100, probably 650, 650,000. Under 100 and, million? <laughs> right, <laughs> oh, no, sorry, it was, it was under a million. Yeah. Um, and Which is also under 100 million. Right, it is. Exactly. <laughs> also true. You gotta um, fudge the numbers a little bit. Exactly. Put people on their yeah, toes. Totally. Um, but yeah, I mean, that was a conversation with Ryan and we really went through about, you know, how many takes we felt like it was, we figured out exactly what our shooting ratio was going to be. I think there might have been a crew member sacrificed in the deal, you know, instead of a three and three crew. Not, not literally shoot. sacrificed. Not but literally <laughs> sacrificed. Whatever it takes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but you know, you, you make compromises. Yeah. So less, less lights. Smaller crew make that work in that way, or occasionally it's a day. But you sort of you have to figure out where those compromises are going to be made, and if it's worth it to you, you fight for them. Well, and that's where a great line producer really helps you out. You know, and a bad one do doesn't. It, yeah. You know, it's like well, because all filmmaking is intelligent compromise. That's the whole process we go through. You never have enough. I mean, Colin will be able to vouch for this. No matter what your budget is, you never have enough time. You never have enough money. That's you, you're in this. It's weird when you're doing a huge film. You're in the same position you were when you were doing a tiny film. It's you're always, and there's a good reason for that. You're always trying to get as much on screen as you possibly can. And so, whatever the the box that's built for you by the economics of the project, you're you're always trying to push up against those those walls. And so, you need help from your team in terms of how you arrange things and and how you make that work. But yeah, yeah. I feel like so, sorry. Go ahead. No, I was just going to. I mean, do you? I, I have a. I have a. I, I wonder sometimes if if at least to me like. Film helps me believe that the thing I'm watching actually happened, mm -hmm. in a way that that digital doesn't. And 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 I think oh, yeah. that it, suspension of disbelief. Suspension of disbelief. Huge, and and just to, as I was mentioning, you know, with the the Raptors and the motorcycles, like when you you know when you when you're talking about the these kinds of movies where you're putting, where you're presenting people things that obviously you know aren't happening in our real world to present it in in uh to present it on film I, I feel like it just does something to your brain and to your ability to, to suspend that disbelief because it doesn't feel like it was made inside a computer it you know it feels like well the you know the light bounced off those raptors and traveled you know in here and, and now is you know it hit the silver and and that's the i don't know there, there's I, I i i definitely i struggle not just with with period films that are shot on digital, as far as feeling like uh, that they were real uh, and and part of my memories, uh, and it doesn't, you know, I feel like when when I think of my dreams, they were they were on film. My dreams are shot on film. Yeah. <laughs> no, I think I think suspension of disbelief is a huge part of it. I mean, you, we're meant to be talking about storytelling as part of this, and I think I've noticed the same thing Colin's noticed, which is when I see something shot on film and particularly projected on film as well. Uh, that process of suspension of disbelief is much more effective for me. And I think that's true for audiences as well. And I think a lot of the money and effort that goes into post-production on uh, video films is achieving that suspension of disbelief rather than you don't often see uh, 
films that have been shot on video where you get kind of a raw feed, where you get really the way that that medium looks because filmmakers are a little afraid of it. They tend to want to mm -hmm. make it feel more like film because there is this indefinable assist that it gives you with the suspension of disbelief. And what you bump up against in a storytelling sense as a filmmaker is the inherent artifice of what it is we do. We aim at naturalism. We feel like we're much more naturalistic than you know the filmmakers of the 1920s or whatever, but we're not. We're dealing in, in artifice. We're dealing in, in theatrical ideas and, and the way they're written. Um, and even though you aim at that naturalism, you're always telling the story in the time you're in and with the devices and the accepted conventions that you have. And for me, film is an incredibly important tool in the, in the storytelling toolkit to allow the audience access to that, to allow them the terms of the storytelling and just dive in mm -hmm. and accept your you know, raptors and motorbikes or whatever. Yeah. I also think it's worth pointing out, because obviously we're talking about bigger films we do, I think that issue is even more important for small films. I mean, that's how I feel. I know we spoke about that, that and I'd like to hear you speak on this, but yeah, I mean, I feel, you know, for my six-figure movies, you don't have every tool that you might have on a Jurassic World, but this is, this is really the only tool I need to, in the first 30 seconds of the movie, have people say, oh, this takes place in, in the world of cinema. Like, this, this movie is artificial. There's lighting, there's, there's cutting, there's music, and I know that because this feels so alive in that way that, move, you know, that kind of the disbelief does. And to me, it's the best asset I've had on distinguishing the look and feel of very small films. And you don't have the ability to go back and fix stuff or reshoot things later or stitch things together. You really, it's just, if you have 20 days, that's all you've got. And if you're shooting it one way, then those 20 days will, I think, look very dramatically different. Well, it feels committed. That's yeah. what I felt watching a film. It feels very committed. And that, as an audience member, brings me into it. To be clear, he's talking about my film. <laughs> I was. <laughs> just, just. <laughs> So as long as we're on the record. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I'd love to hear you speak about this and you know, the decisions you make. Sorry, I'll just phrase this. It's so much fun to make those decisions for me. I mean, I love when you're like, we can only do this one more time. Yeah. That's, my favorite, that's my favorite take of the day when it's like, we're out, we're, out, like we're done with it. We can't keep shooting right now. And everybody knows that it's game on. I think that's sort of what you were speaking to. Um, I mean, I would say two things. One is I completely agree that there's an inherent authenticity that you just immediately buy into. And I would even say that there's an inherent empathy. And so much of what we're doing is about creating an experience where you know, the whole objective is to put the audience in our main characters' shoes, or you know, if it's an ensemble cast, plural, plural main characters, but to create a subjective experience. And so if you can help the audience to empathize in any way, like what better tool could you ask for? Um, and then just to speak to the intimacy of it, you know, there's something that's really special that happens both when you're shooting single camera, but also when you're shooting film, I find that the director ends up standing right next to me and they're having this really immediate experience with the actors and looking at the actors in real life. And I feel like that translates to where, you know, you have, when you have Video Village and it's a mile away and everybody's weighing in because they think that they're gauging the real, you know, they're seeing, it, they're seeing something on the monitor that they think is the final image. Yeah. And so you have, you know, if there's one hair out of place, people can see it and somebody's running in to adjust a hair and that, that affects the actor. And I think when you, you know, that when you, on our budgets, when you shoot film and you have a very poor quality monitor, people kind of let you do your thing. Best. They, yeah. don't, they, don't, they don't work at all, so nobody even bothers with <laughs> totally. that. Totally. Yeah. Um, a, six, so, a Super 16 tap into a monitor looks like scrambled pornography from the 80s. <laughs> <laughs> and it keeps people away from where the fun is happening. And it, you know, it does. For, yeah. for a medium that already tends to have too many cooks in the kitchen, it's really, I think it's really special when you get to have a small intimate set where it's, you know, me, the director, the talent, and that's kind of it. I mean, the focus puller, the boom operator, and that's it. Well, it's, it's shocking to me actually that cinematographers haven't defended film more. I guess there's a feeling of not wanting to get left behind by progress or something, but the authority of the light meter, the authority of the DP on set being really the only person who really knows how it's going to turn out. Um, that speeds the process. That keeps you know, your eye with authority where it needs to be in collaboration with the director. It stops everybody looking over your shoulder and saying, oh, that's too bright, that's too dark, or whatever. I mean, it's, it's a very, uh, very valuable thing for, for DPs. I'm surprised they haven't defended it. More. I think that there's a fear of you know, both, ultimately as a DP, it's our job to also be adjustable and to be, you know, yeah. 
not every, not every medium is right for every story. To the extent that if we're saying, you know, digital is watercolor and film is, is oil painting or vice versa, like, you know, for some things watercolor is better. I, I, I'm not saying, and, and certainly for me, you know, I need to be, I need to be able to sort of roll with the different, I mean, constraints of a, constraints of a project regardless, but also there are occasions where I have found that digital can work to the, to, to, to our advantage, specifically if you have a ton of improv, if you have, you know, child actors, if you have things, in our case, where we don't have the budget to keep shooting, you know, occasionally it's more important to have the ability to get, you know, more takes. And so that, it, that always becomes part of the decision. But I think as a DP, to say I can only shoot on film would mean that I was getting, you know, one-tenth the phone calls that I get right now, and I can't afford to do that, so <laughs> there you go. Yeah, my, my cinematographer who shot all four of my movies on 16 or Super 16 for a while, people always say, like, I always say, oh, you should hire him for their movie. And they say, well, we're not going to shoot on film. I say, he's not just the film. <laughs> like, he can do whatever. Right. But he would be really excited if you, if you had that in the budget. But yeah, there's like this fear of being pigeonholed. But you said when we spoke that, you know, like, you feel like people say, oh, like, because you're going to shoot on film, like, as though that's your thing and they don't want to. Well, the problem, yeah, I mean, the. the the studio system has a wonderful ability to sort of patronize filmmakers. It has a wonderful ability to absorb. It's sort of what you were talking about with the Raptors and the, and the motorbikes. It was a, it's a tricky point, I think, <laughs> for people to understand. But what, I know exactly what you're talking about. It's like whatever, you know, whatever's outside the mainstream or seems like a crazy idea or whatever, if it works, it just gets absorbed in. And the way that happens with film at the moment is it sort of becomes like, oh, it's your thing or, oh, it's, you know, but it's not, not for everybody. Having said which, I mean, I think the way that the studios rallied together in support of Kodak a couple of years ago to really keep film going was, was incredible. And which you spearheaded and... With a, with a lot of different filmmakers, all different stripes. I mean, obviously there's, you know, Quentin and JJ and people like that, but also Judd Apatow mm -hmm. was a big force. A lot, of, a lot of different filmmakers coming together to do that. Um, and a lot of studios, all the studios really being very, very supportive, um, which was wonderful to see. But the danger is that if it's the same voices continually talking about, yeah, you, you stop being heard. And it's um, your guy's fetish, and everyone just says, they're just these guys who don't want to adapt. And yeah, yeah. I mean, when you mentioned that Judd Apatow kind of joined, joined the cause, you know, saying he wants to shoot a different kind of movie that way, I think that does a lot oh, yeah. for the kind of argument that I hope we can, you know, address here. Um, but those, you know, don't those comedies feel like they have weight? Like, those comedies yeah. feel like they happened. There's something different about Judd Apatow's movies that he shoots on film. There's, a, there's an authority to them. Yeah. Uh, that you know, I, I they, they don't they don't just fly away like totally. they don't just They're disappear. Twenty-seven percent funny. We, <laughs> we have the number. We have the number. Twenty-seven percent. But just, there's yeah. there is a danger though I think of of it turning into like, you know, it's it's vinyl like we're you know we're just a bunch of people who need to hear it on vinyl because it sounds better and and it's it's not that it's but vinyl not just that has come back. Vinyls come back in but a very small way, but that's what we talked about. Is no, I know in a very, very big way, actually. For the record, it's it's a huge, literally for the record, huge turnaround. <laughs> and uh, but I don't like making the comparison. It's comforting to those of us who want to explain to people that, as I say, it's not about technical progress or interfering with technical progress. It's about recognizing distinct and useful mm -hmm. media. Um, but you're talking about a consumer format. There's no yeah. reason on earth that the audience should give two hoots what's in the booth projected. What they should care about is what's up on screen. It's our responsibility as filmmakers to fight for the right thing to be in the booth so that we give the audience the experience they want. Somehow the, the corporate interests around the issue have managed to make it some kind of consumer advocacy issue or something in terms of, you know, the consumer should care that the film has been shot on an iPhone or shot this. Like, why? A, a story is a story, right. a movie is a movie. What you should care about is what's, what's up there on screen yeah. or how it's made. I'll make this one last point and then we can go to questions, but yeah, I mean, what you're saying with the diversity of voices who want to use this as their, as their uh, medium, there, there is a connection in between the Jurassic World, Interstellar, Star Wars films, and then our, the, our size movies, which is just that if you guys are fighting for something, then there is no hope for 20 years from now when you're slowing down or, you know, the, hey. we, <laughs> fine. <laughs> That's You're never going to cool. slow down. Oh. But you know what? I, you, ha, you, you, have to build, cool. you have to build something. Build something. <laughs> you have to build something that lasts. Right really now. Really, Scott's 78. Okay, so I got my eyes. <laughs> was was got Exodus shot on film? 
No, he, he, he doesn't he's, he's way out. He's, he's out. No, no, I mean, he's, he, he loves his digital, he loves to yeah, he's 3D gone. particularly. Yeah, I know, so, I mean, so why are we talking about it? Because <laughs> he's a great filmmaker working in uh, Who makes more, than, more than 20 years from yeah. where I'm gonna be. <laughs> but you wouldn't want film to go away in your lifetime or at all. So I, would, we, I don't ever want it to go away. It's, so we it's have to build the next. Well, the culture can't ever afford to lose a medium. You can't afford to lose bronze casting. You can't afford to lose marble sculpture. These things are going to have massive importance for future generations, one way or another. And so it's, it's, not, even, it's not even an option for it to go away. The problem right now is ensuring that it doesn't go away temporarily or that it isn't, as you say, it doesn't become an elitist thing whereby newer filmmakers don't feel they're not, they're not mm -hmm. engaged with that choice that they could, could make something that way. That's what I was trying That's to say. Well, a little, bit of that, <laughs> a little bit of that falls on all of us too, because I yeah. think that you know, there isn't a farm system in Hollywood. Like we are, no. we are responsible for, for helping to find the next generation and, and bring them to the fore. And I think in that process, it is a bit of our responsibility, especially if the film schools aren't doing it, to if, if you have a, a filmmaker who you're, you're mentoring or, or, or in that we all help each other, Try to show the benefits of this, and and you know why this is a choice that, that we've all made, and you know, I think it's good to evangelize a little bit, and you know, create yeah. disciples for this, because how else, how else is it going to happen? I mean, you also have, I mean, personally, I think the biggest affront to the way that we that general audiences perceive movies is the alteration of the frame rate on their televisions, mm -hmm. yeah. and you know, motion smoothing is I think is yeah. is the worst thing to happen to movies yeah. in I, recent history, and. I guess a lot of people know what that means, but if, for those who don't, if, or if you're watching a, at home, uh, a lot of major television companies, uh, this, the default on the television when they give it to you has a frame rate that actually inserts additional, uh, somehow manufac digitally manufactured frames into your 24 frames a second, and it makes everything look like you're watching a Spanish soap opera. Yeah. Even the coolest, no, and, no, and it's, it's terrible. It's, it's terrible, and I was actually, I didn't want to bring it up because it's too complicated an issue, but as you get into things like high frame rates, what are the things that are going to happen in the future? The problem is if we don't establish the principle right now that the filmmaker should be determining how the film is shown, how the film is acquired, how the film is shown, which has always been filmmaker's right, um, then as things get more and more um, disparate in terms of what people like, what people don't like, things like high frame rate that some people like, some people just are absolutely allergic to it, would never want the film to be seen that way. Um, we have to be able to have control of that. We have to be able to talk to the TV companies and say the default setting needs to be for 24 frames, you know, playback, not a, a sort of interpolated 48 or 60 or whatever. Um, and and that, so that's, it's not just about celluloid, it's about it's about the rights of filmmakers. I mean, literally, the, the rights to be able to determine, you know, what the form, what the medium is that they're, they're working in. I will say one thing that I was able to do on this front is, uh, for Jurassic, we had a partnership with Samsung where they were going to show some footage from the movie a couple weeks in, the, in all the Best Buys mm. on the Samsung TVs. They were going to be showing footage that no one could see, so you'd go in a Best Buy and see it. And I said, the only way I'll do this is if at the Best Buy they all have to calibrate it to not have the motion smoothing on if they're gonna watch the movie. And around the country, it, and I went, I like went to many Best Buys to make sure this was happening. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I did. Did you talk to them about changing the default setting? Because that would I, be the best, it's gonna be changed. It is, like, you know, I, I think that, I, I, I'm as vocal as, and you know, and you know, the, Samsung was a partner on that film, and I was, I was, pretty, I was pretty vocal about it to everybody that I could talk to. I'm not really sure, what? Who what? benefits from it being the default? Yeah, I don't sports. know. They, people Sorry. prefer to watch sports. But can't you just have a button? For movies. Th yeah, yeah. Th and just no, have it be, th and then have a sports button. Have it the other way around if you want to watch a football game. I, I agree. Th Tell them they can't show Star Wars on Samsung TVs unless they right, that, right? you <laughs> Or, like, or tell, them, tell them they can't have Star Wars at all unless they stop this. And then I think that'll fix things really I just don't, I don't see what the, <laughs> you gotta I don't see what the, power. you gotta be careful. I, I don't one see what the upside is. One of my dear friends who's also a DP, Reed Moreno, actually started a petition to, to make, uh, to basically stop motion interpolation as the default. So. Everybody go sign her petition. Absolutely, where it's, it's online. And, it's online yeah. and go, and I'll say this on behalf of Ryan Johnson, who, like, who is, you know, has a whole campaign about this as well. Go to your parents' house, go to your grandparents' house, go when you right. go over right. Thanksgiving, <laughs> fix their tie. I remember going home to my dad, it's my dad's birthday today, happy birthday, I think he's watching, my dad's 70. Uh, yeah, for dad, happy birthday. <laughs>
Uh, you walk in and he's watching, you know, he's watching Man on Fire or something. I'm like, what the hell, ha what's going on, man? And I just immediately go and fix it. So please, uh, just walk into strangers' houses, knock on their doors. Yeah. <laughs> well, Every Airbnb you ever stay in. Don't let any kids watch it that way, because what we can't have is a generation of kids growing up who don't know what a movie's supposed to look like. Absolutely. And that, that's the danger. And filmmakers <laughs> have to have that power. All right, well, I guess we've, we can go to questions for the remainder, and I'll repeat them, or if they're not good, I will just go to another one. <laughs> uh, is it up to me to, call, to point at people? Uh, I saw that guy in the hat right there first, with the pom-pom. No, no, you're the only one with the pom-pom on. Uh, hi, thank you, all three of you, for coming here. Um, what do you imagine um, movie theaters are going to be different uh, 20 years from now, what's, what do you think is the biggest thing that's going to change in auditoriums? Good question. Big oh, oh, sorry. I'll, 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 I don't need to repeat it. You had a microphone. All right, never no, mind. I mean, yeah, it's, it, it, that's a difficult thing. That's a game that the studios are often trying to play. My fear is that the biggest thing that will be different is there will be no booth at all and there will be a satellite you know, feed of the film that's compressed in some way that filmmakers haven't been allowed to consult on. And that's one of the reasons we're, we're trying to fight a lot of these fights now, so that we can have a voice in that. Uh, my hope, though, is that the screens are going to be bigger, uh, you know, the seating is going to be better, and, and the premium idea of the experience uh, is going to be enhanced. And I think there will be film projectors in the best theaters. I really do. I mean, that's, that's my hope and, and my belief. I'm old enough to have lived through the first era of multiplexing that was horrendous, where they would take a big theater like this one and just kind of put a couple of walls up and make these little boxes. Um, and that was very, very damaging to the health of movies and the rise of home video came along and eventually the multiplexes that were built in the 90s were fantastic and so much better and so much better thought through. So I'm, I'm hopeful that, you know, as the distinction needs to be made from home entertainment, the theaters get better and better. And, and I think it's turning into a more social experience. You know, people are offering drinking plus 21 theaters and dinner theaters and things yeah. like that to encourage people to really make a night of it and also to converse, which is huge. Yeah. Yeah, I think the the communal experience of watching a movie with a group, I think I also, you know, one place where I'm a proponent of digital is being able to spread that out into, into events and into sports. I mean, the, one of the coolest experiences I've had in a theater is watching the World Cup uh, with, you know, 500 people and we, everyone was just going crazy and talking and, you know, throwing popcorn at each other and it was just awesome. And, and I think that's actually one place where, where digital distribution can, can, can help it can help movies in a certain way because anytime you have a great experience in a theater, you remember why you ever did that in the first place, as opposed to sitting at home and watching on TV. And I think, you know, one of the reasons why I think our, our movie did well is because it provided an opportunity for large groups of people to get together and scream and yell and cheer and and all of those reasons that we go to the movie. And it, it is kind of an addictive, uh, an addictive thing. And and you know, film aside, so I, I think that whatever we can do to to keep the movie movie houses alive and 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 not have it turn into even with film projection not have it turn into you know well my parents go to the opera but I don't go to the opera anymore make sure young kids go to the opera and make sure that we have we have I want you know I don't have it you know Save the Not Guaranteed was the last movie to show on film uh, in Burlington Vermont where I live and they they went digital and, and it was a it was a bummer uh, but my kid can't go watch film where I live. That's, that's not an option for us. We'd have to probably drive to, to New York and <coughs> there just barely. I mean, even the Ziegfeld's shutting down. Today. Today? Yeah, today's the last day. Oh, what a, is today oh, Thursday? Man. Yeah, today's the last day for the Ziegfeld. Mm. I read online um, where I saw several movies in 70 millimeter in the last few years. And yeah. It's all gone with the wind there on 35. Now I'm all <laughs> bummed. Um, <laughs> Yeah, should we? I mean, and I, can I just add one thing to that, which is that I think the trick is people will go to the theater to see dinosaurs. It's getting people to go to the theater to see more intimate, more sort of you know dramatic, kind of smaller movies. And, um, but you know, I think if you look at what T Todd Carroll, Todd, sorry, Todd Haynes, Todd Haynes and Ed Lockman did with Carol, I mean, everybody that I've myself included that saw that movie said, go see it in a theater. Mm -hmm. And I think that really yep. sort of changed the experience of watching that movie. The second you see a drama at home, the phone rings, you get a text, it, it takes you out of it. But one of, the, one of the things that's going on there that has to be spoken about is if, if the films are acquired digitally, if they're presented digitally, the distinction for the audience between what they can see on their great equipment at home and what's in the cinema 
is much, much smaller than when film is involved at either end of the chain. And that is damaging movies. I mean, it, it has to be addressed. I mean, we need, we need movie theaters to be providing an experience that you can't get at home. And that's why I'm actually optimistic about what the quality of those theaters is going to be in 20 years, because that's the economic imperative. They're going to have to get better and better as home entertainment systems have got better and better. Mm -hmm. or, or make really good drinks. <laughs> exactly. Uh, where's the nearest microphone? Like, uh, all right, well, we'll pick that guy there with the hat, because the, the microphone lady wants him to, to ask a question. Uh, hello, one, two. Uh, yeah, my question is actually directed to Mr. Nolan. Uh, my name is Casey. Hello. Um, so your films, uh, they reflect a high level of intelligence. And I, I wonder, uh, you, you collaborate with your brother as well a lot. So I, could you give a brief rundown of the process of, of, of your stories and their creation? I mean, it's so different on each film. I wouldn't want to get too bogged down in it at the expense of the, the real subject of the panel, but every film's been different in the way in which we've, we approach it, where sometimes I'm writing on my own, sometimes I'm writing from something with my brother or, or David Goy or other collaborators I've, I've worked with. Um, but it's probably too long an answer for, for this panel. So if anyone has a question about film, we'll point to you now. Um, yeah, let's think, uh, I can't really see anybody. How about this guy here in the black hoodie and the glasses? Hello, uh, thank you for coming out today. Um, my question is actually more in relation to piracy. Do you see film projection as a good way to sort of combat the piracy? Like if people feel like they need to see a film in the theater, is that better than just downloading it to their phone? And Absol like, absolutely. Can we use that to convince people to well, shoot it, on it, film? I mean, as far as arguments go, I, I mean, yes, anything that makes the film experience in public more distinct from what you can you can get at home helps, um, and you know for the record, if you take a 70 mil IMAX print, if somebody can figure out how to pirate that, good luck to them. You know, it's like it, my films come on 44 reels, each reel's this big, and it has to be. I mean, you know, it's you can't pirate it um, with any efficiency or whatever. And so um, it is much more easy these days to to protect your your material and keep it. Um, you know, keep it private until it's ready to go out in the world. Um, yeah, absolutely. I do think if you're willing to watch a pirated movie on your computer, you're probably the most difficult convert that we could ever reach <laughs> imaginable. Like, uh, you're, not, you're not putting, uh, you know, exhibition quality at the top of your, no. your list of priorities. It, it, it is amazing how far piracy has come in our lifetime from video cameras in the movie theater. Yeah. So let's, let's, give, let's give them their credit. The, the, pir the, oh, yeah. pirates, have, the pirates have yeah, adapted the pirates. as well. Yeah. By, by, well stop, by stopping bringing camcorders into a movie theater. At least you don't see that anymore. Oh, they, you do. That's how they pirate my phones. Cause you, I guess, oh, because you can't uh, get them up cause, because that's yeah, it. Exactly. That's so why can download a pirated video cam of a 70 millimeter interstellar? Probably. Yeah. yeah. With somebody's head in them. Yeah. <laughs> Although it does, it, I, like, you know, as far as the democratization of, of, of making films, it, you do approach it with a very different attitude. You know, when, when I when Save the Not Guaranteed came out, all I cared about is people watching it. I, I wasn't really thinking about piracy, like pirate it, whatever. Just watch my movie, please. And and you know what is on Netflix. So, you know all of those things are, are a great benefit. And I think is you once you see the level of just blood, sweat, and tears that goes into making uh, you know any film, but especially you know these larger films. People work so hard and they leave their families behind, and it's it is it is difficult. And so it, it to me it, there there's a great disrespect. Uh, in in deciding, uh, you know, I'm just gonna throw this in my computer and then text while I have watch it. Yeah, I wouldn't even. I don't know how to even get stuff like that. People say, "Oh, the movie leaked," and I say, "I don't know. I don't know how." Yeah, that how, where do you find that? I don't know how that stuff works at all. It's beyond my comprehension of technology. Um, are there any women who want to ask? Oh, there's one right there on the aisle. Thank you all for coming. Um, my question is kind of related to the, an earlier question about the future of film. Um, one of the things at Sundance, at, down at New Frontier, there's a lot of VR stuff going on. It's seeming to become more and more popular over the years. So I was just wondering what you guys think about that and if any of you um, ever see yourself making anything um, in a VR format. Um, I, mean, I, I can jump on that because I actually just started to collaborate with Chris Milk on some VR stuff. I think VR should be looked at as a tool, just like you know, the same way we're sort of saying that if you know, digital is I, uh, what did I say? Watercolor, film is oil, VR is, is you know, 
Photoshop. Pastel. It's, it's it's a whole different medium. Sculpture. But it, but it, it's it's its own it's its own medium and it and it serves certain things really well and I think it's it's just we're all we're sort of fighting for is more choices and so I don't think VR takes away from you know either of no not not at all and one of the things one of the benefits of being old enough that I only have twenty years left is boy. Yeah. <laughs> I, um, boy do I I'm I'm, I'm never going to not regret that. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> I've, I've lived through the first wave of VR. I've lived through two waves of 3D. I lived the, the, the thing you have to look at is virtual reality, if it's coming along as it's supposed to be now, and I've seen some impressive demos, it'll be its own medium. And I never get asked anymore, oh, do you think video games are going to kill movies? Ten years ago, I was being asked that all the time. It's like, no, they're completely different media. It's wonderful to have a new, a new medium. It's extremely exciting. Um, and I certainly wouldn't rule out working in it on a particular project. But it's not in opposition to, to the status quo. It's additive, I think. Um, where's, where's the nearest microphone? Uh, all right, let's, yeah. I guess you, you, you're very good at picking people for, for us. Um, yeah, just float it in there. Hi. Uh, thank, thank you, all four of you. you. I think you guys all are an excellent example of um, storytelling that has patience. And I think that's connected a little bit to this medium that we're talking about. Um, so I'm somebody that's right now kind of on the front lines. I'm teaching, you know, 13 year old kids in an after school program about cinema. And so um, maybe connected to that, you know, I just want to get your advice on what is the thing if, if, I, if I am having to make the compromise and have them shoot digitally, what's the thing that can give them a little bit of insight into maybe a storytelling process that transitions them to really appreciate the medium of film and and is it film history? Is it cinematic language? You know, just something along those lines. I would say before you have them shoot video, give them a still, a still film camera and have them shoot 24 films and tell a story that way. Um, at least is the first step. If you can tell, you know, if you can tell a story with 24 still frames, then you can then you can start telling bigger stories. That would be my my suggestion. Yeah, I think that's a, a great suggestion because it changes the thinking. I mean, the, the problem, we, we talked a little bit about it earlier on when we talked about Video Village, because the thing you fight with the increase in video technology on sets, the thing you fight is your collaborators viewing it as a two-dimensional medium. So they look at the image as two-dimensional. Um, I sit by the camera, I don't look at a video, it's just to sort of watch the actors. And so there's a lot of thought that that immediately puts into your collaboration with the DP about camera placement, for example, about not just putting on a, a longer lens and not moving the camera. You sort of start to understand the proximity of the camera creating a different effect and so forth. And it's very difficult to explain that if all you know kids are ever seeing is the, the immediate 2D translation. So that they look, one of the problems with a lot of video technology now is it doesn't have a viewfinder. So it's all on screens. And to harp on a theme, if you're as old as I am, it means you stop putting reading glasses on, but which is a pain in the ass. You don't do that with a viewfinder. But it also it creates a different kind of thinking. You're looking at a picture the whole time. Instead of with a camera you're looking through, you're much more in the space. You're much more connected with the, the three-dimensional nature of what it is you're creating. And all of the, the progress in film history, all of that great continuum that, that we get to tap into now as filmmakers in you know, 2016, it's all about figuring out how to translate the three-dimensional storytelling onto a screen that, that people can watch. And that, that's a difficult thing to get across to, to kids. Um, but I mean, we were joking about it earlier. I think a very important thing to do is make sure that whatever you're showing on the film history is being shown at the right frame rate. You know, it's, it's a real issue. It's like, it, it, you know, we made a joke of it, but it's, it's very important that kids are seeing what films are supposed to look like, you know, in the past to understand film history. Now, if they then want to change that and advance that, and move that, terrific. But understanding where it's come from and, you know, I mean, I grew up, when I was a kid, silent films were always projected at 24 frames a second incorrectly on television. So we all grew up thinking that Charlie Chaplin walked too fast, you know. And then Kevin Brownlow came along and was like, no, you idiots, they were shot at 18 frames a second. You have to transfer them at 18 frames a second. And now you get a Blu-ray of a great silent film like City Lights or something, and you see it the way it was supposed to look. And it's, it's very important for, for kids trying to absorb film history that they're shown it in the right way. Yeah. I agree. I, I was, we were, Rachel and I were talking about this earlier, just the value of 
of not, to, you know, I would show my kids Charlie Chaplin and Harold Lloyd and just be able to see, you know, just physical comedy at a very young age, how they can, they can perceive it, but also just, you know, all the technology aside, uh, just talking about, you know, the, the nature of storytelling in a way that kids can understand. You know, I didn't, when I went to NYU, I focused almost entirely on writing and learning how to tell a story. And, and with, uh, with my son and my daughter, as, as they're starting to write stories, we talk about, Way, you know, in a way that the kid can understand. You know, you have you have a, a, a river, and there's many stones across the river. In order to get to the other side, you step on this stone, and this stone, and this stone. And each one of those stones is a part of your story. And I think to be able to instill that in them and have them understand it on a fundamental level will make a huge difference in their ability to take what's in their brain and communicate it uh, into a into a medium of any kind. Um, all right, I think there's like time for two more. Hello. Uh, you're in the middle. Hello. You seem to have a microphone. Hello. Uh, is someone already asking a question? Oh. Hello. Hi. Wait, over, over here? No? I have no idea where this question is coming from. I got, it's over here. Uh, over here doesn't help. Sorry. <laughs> and, and then we're going to go with this child here. I think cool. was the last question. This oh, is, man. Important. I beat so, out a child. I apologize. Um, so set it, up, set it up for him, and then we'll... I was super aggressive about, <laughs> about being able to say something, because I want to thank all of you. And I just wanted to let you know that because of Lorette Bale from Kodak, who's in the room, um, we premiered my film, Outlaws and Angels, which, shot, which was <laughs> shot for way less than a million bucks on a film print on Monday night. And uh, <clears throat> it was a magical experience being able to project on film. Um, I'm, we're going to be playing here tonight. It won't be a film print, but it still looks beautiful. Um, we shot on 35. Um, and I just wanted to say <clears throat> thank you, uh, because there are, I don't think it's an old thing or a young thing, really. Um, I got in a huge argument with William Friedkin about film versus digital, and he got really irate <clears throat> and said that Kodak was closed. Um, so I think a lot of people who are a lot older are getting out of touch and thinking that um, film isn't great. But you do have disciples, all of you up there, um, me and a lot of the, uh, the up and coming guys who have, who have shot films recently are, are huge proponents of film, we're purists and we want to keep capturing on the best medium possible. Um, and I don't think it would be possible if it weren't for big guys like you out there fighting for film. Um, so I just wanted to say thank you. Um, and I wanted to say, please, um, my question to you that you can't answer is, is will you please never stop? Uh, because, because a lot of these guys, you'll hear fighting for film, and then a couple years later, they change their mind. David Lynch kind of went back and forth. He's shooting film again, which is great. Um, but I just wanted to tell you, film's a very emotional thing for me. Um, I'm passionate about it, um, and I'm fighting with a huge group of people in the trenches um, who are just coming up to keep shooting film. So thank you, thank you, and thank you again. Yeah, thank I, you. I can... I can... Uh... I can promise. I can promise one thing. I, you know, there there's a lab in Rochester that where Kodak is making. It's the last lab that is making film here in America. Uh, and and if it were to ever close, I I promise. I mean, you know, we'll take a selfie for you, but we'll be out there in front uh, on the lines, uh, either you know trying to stop it or at least buying up every every last uh, reel. Uh, but but that would be that would be a truly tragic thing. Uh, and I I don't mean to, you know use hyperbole in, in saying the word tragic, but, but there, there, is only, there is one town in this country that, is, uh, that has a, a lab, that has a factory that is, is manufacturing film. And one of, the, one of the biggest problems and the reason why you know, Kodak has struggled so much is that most of, their, mo most of their profit came from making film prints. It's not from making the film that we all shoot on. And so the loss of, of, of that avenue of exhibition has, you know, has created a company who is doing everything within their power uh, to, to keep manufacturing film long into the future. Uh, and so whatever, whatever all of us can do, and, and I know uh, anyone who, who loves movies can do, uh, will, will definitely be a very beneficial thing. Yeah, I mean, that is part of what's become interesting. And you mentioned this, that directors like Friedkin and people like that, when they restore their films, they want them on DCP. And they say, this is the definitive way to see it. This is how I always wanted it to look. Well, no, I mean, it makes no yeah, sense. But you're generalizing. I mean, and this is one of the problems. That's true for a handful of people. Who get the press. They get what's, press for it. What's, yeah, exactly. Or, you know, it can seem current or whatever. There are plenty of filmmakers, some of whom aren't around anymore to advocate, advocate for themselves, some of whom, whom are, but for whom that's not true. And the DCP. A DCP is only ever going to be, if you've shot your film on film, and that's the way it existed, some great film of the past for some filmmaker, a DCP is only ever going to be a translation, only ever going to be a, a slice. And that digital technology, one of the wonderful things about digital video technology is it advances continuously. And so whatever 
you know, form, you know, we just put out a Blu-ray of the Quay Brothers films. We had to go back to the original films to remaster it because the video masters that were made in 2008, which were meant to last forever and whatever, they, the technology has moved on since then. The film is timeless, and the film can be those films. You know, when they need to be redone again at 4K, 8K, 12K, there'll be visible improvement in that presentation every time, and, mm -hmm. and that's it's important to, to talk about, you know, the digital version of it is only ever going to be a translation. Yeah, and you're right, it, it does get picked up in the press when people, yeah. a few people make a lot of noise saying, yeah. this is how I always wanted to look and I don't want these scratchy beat up prints. And yeah. when there is a Friedkin retrospective in New York and I went to both screenings of Sorcerer because he said this is the last time this will ever play on 35 because the DCP is almost done. So I just said, I need to see this twice because I'll never get to experience yeah. this, this thing again. And the print was so good. I mean, it just yeah. looked better than anything. And I don't ever want to see that movie on DCP or his restored Blu-ray. I want to buy that print so I can own it. Well, and you can also work, I mean, just working as hard as you can to find uh, ways to use film to create an experience that you can't capture anyone else. Here's a sentence that was actually said out loud, which will sound crazy. Uh, I asked the question, is it possible for us to shoot IMAX uh, film plates in actual space uh, for Star Wars? And, and I haven't gotten an answer yet, but I, I know, that, I mean, they, they've shot IMAX in space. Well, we, yeah, funny enough, we had that <laughs> like, conversation on Interstellar. Yeah, and be, the be crazy. Was, well, the payload, you know, yeah, you blah, blah, this, but no, you keep, keep. The it. questions are being asked. Oh yeah, I mean, those, those cameras, I mean, you've probably seen the, the footage, but there's incredible footage from space with those film cameras and there's nothing they can do now to. I think we need you guys to figure that out before we can start shooting movies on location in <laughs> outer space. It sounds, <laughs> um, I know right, it so sounds we'll a question from the, from the child and then that's the last one. I feel like this is going to be great. <laughs> no pressure. Um, so I'm Jameson Stagg and um, I really want to become a filmmaker when I grow up. Um, and I was just wondering, this is kind of just a general question, but do you have any um, sort of tips as far as story goes for young film filmmakers like me? Well, <laughs> good question. You go first? Sure, uh, yeah. Um, what is, what is my, my answer is to, you know, I know a lot of people tell you to watch a lot of movies, and that's important too. Uh, but don't forget to live a full life and don't forget to travel and don't forget to meet a lot of different people and, and expose yourself to different perspectives and different ways of looking at the world because we make movies for the whole world uh, now. It is, it is, it is an export that, uh, that America has and part of our responsibility uh, is to not be sitting in the dark all the time uh, watching the world through uh, the lenses of others, but, but to go out and, and live ourselves and have your heart broken and, and all those things that, uh, that will, will make you a complete human being. That's so, that's so eloquent. I really just watch movies. That would, that would, that's what I would have said. And, re and, re and read a lot. <clears throat> I, I would true. just I would just add two things. One is you know you're never too young. You, you can start now. I think both. I was reading that you know Chris, you started at eight, seven or eight. Yeah. And I I was the same, more from a still photography perspective. But like somebody just sent me a picture. Probably I, I couldn't have been older than four or five, and I'm the only one not in the picture. And we figured out it was because I was the one taking the picture. Um, so start now. But also you know speak from your experience, and you know your your experience as it grows will inform the work that you do. I mean, yeah, the only thing I'd say is reading is very important and getting to grips with the, the written word because you, you get into filmmaking as a kid uh, out of a love for the, the moving image and connecting a series of images. But there's a point where it starts to have to be about the words because that's what's going to give you the framework to, to put those images to. And, uh, you know, you sort of wind up having to be a writer. I never wanted to be a writer. And then you wind up having to be a writer because that's a, a part of your filmmaking process. I think that Kodak should give this kid one of these new Super 8 cameras. Definitely. Yeah. Uh, all right, thanks everybody. I think that's it for us. Uh, thank you everybody, and thank you Sundance for asking us to do this, and oh, Colin, yes. Chris, Rachel.